come across someone who has said emphatically that God doesn't exist. They, they would call themselves an atheist. Okay, yeah. Most of us have encountered someone like that. And if you haven't, you probably will sometime, right? Um, not everybody has doubts, but most people do at certain times. Uh, there was a Gallup poll done back in 2011, and they asked the question to the people, do you believe in God? 92% of the people that they polled said, yeah, I believe in God. Now, that sounds like a, a high percentage, and it is, but the, the, the um, kind of startling thing was that they did that same survey seven years earlier, and when they asked the question, only 1% identified themselves as atheist. Seven years later, it was up to 5%. You say, well, that's still not very high, and that's true, but just think if it, if it grew at that percentage rate every seven years the way that it did there. And we know, based on, uh, on polls and different things that have gone on here just the last couple of years, that atheism is growing in our country, uh, and probably worldwide, but for sure in our country. So you may not uh, have encountered a full-on atheist at this point, but you certainly, some Somewhere along the line are going to come across someone who is doubting God. Someone who is doubting the existence of God. It may be, it may be someone in your family. It may be someone at your workplace. It may be someone in your church. It may be. And we talked about that last week, that the reality is that sometimes we struggle with doubts ourselves. Just because we are followers of Christ doesn't mean that we are exempt from struggling with deep questions and sometimes doubts about very spiritual issues, and the most spiritual issues would be God himself, right? And so I want to encourage you, if you weren't here with us last week, we kind of laid the groundwork series and we talked about the reality that doubt is going to be there and then we looked very closely at how Jesus dealt with doubters and uh, I think for some I think it was probably very surprising but also very encouraging today we want to look specifically as we really start diving into our series we want to look at this whole idea of the existence of God is he there and do we know for sure can we, can we say without a doubt, yeah, there's a And before we jump into that, I want to I wanna kind of overlap a little bit on where we ended last week on dealing with doubters, but we're talking specifically this morning about dealing with God doubters. And remember last week we said that there's kind of a golden rule in Scripture with dealing with with doubters, and that's found in Jude 22, the little book right before Revelation. There's one chapter in it, and verse 22 says this, have mercy on some who are doubting. And so we talked about that in more depth last week, but we saw that first of all, when you deal with a doubter, you deal mercifully. And in case you're not quite sure what that means, we, we looked at the definition of that word in the original. It means to help one afflicted or seeking aid. We talked about two kinds of doubters. There's, a, there's the uh, dishonest doubter. The dishonest doubter is someone who doubts and has questions, but they have no intention of trying to find the answers. They're the person that kind of plays devil's advocate. They're the person that wants to stump people, trip them up. They're even maybe sometimes the kind of person that likes to argue. You ever know somebody like that? They enjoy arguing and fighting. It's kind of warped and sick, but there are people out there like that. Some of you are married to people like that. But, but the, the dishonest doubter is the person who raises the doubts but really has no intention of searching out the answers. On the other hand, there's the honest doubter. The honest doubter has doubts. They have questions, but they're pursuing truth. They want to know what the answer is. They want to know if there's some truth or answer to the doubt 
they're having. And so we said that with those folks that are seeking and desiring to know truth, we need to be people that are merciful. And we need to deal mercifully with them. See, the last thing you want to do when you're talking to somebody and they say, well, you know, I'm not even really sure to God. <gasps> what? You know, that's not where we want to go. That's what we don't want to be condemning or, or because the reality is, we talked about last week, our doubts that we have can even help us to be more sympathetic and understanding toward people who are having doubts. And so as we work through our stuff and then we begin to deal with people who have doubts, it, it helps us to be more sympathetic and understanding toward them. So we want to be merciful. We want to deal mercifully with folks that are having doubts. And here's the second idea, and this is, this is uh, a new one this morning for us. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. So the second idea is this, be ready. Be ready. That's partly why we're doing this series. We're doing it for two reasons. Because number one, many of us and we want to peel back the facade that we've got it all together and that we never doubt and we never have any questions and we want to be honest people and say, you know what, I have had questions, I have had doubts, and I, I want to know what those answers are and I want to know for myself to strengthen my faith and to strengthen my hope in God. And then the second reason we're doing this series is so that we can be better equipped to help others. That's how you deal mercifully. You can't render aid to somebody if you don't have anything to aid them with, right? And so one of the main reasons that we're doing this is so that we will be able to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. We'll be able to explain and be ready and so how do you deal with a, a God doubter? Well, you want to be merciful, and then you also want to be ready. You want to be ready to do the best that you can. Now, with that said, I want to make something very clear. You need to understand something this morning. You cannot 100% prove that God exists. You realize that. And the reason that you can't is because we can't see him. We can't touch him. We can't hold him. Scripture, the Bible, never tries to prove God. Do you realize that? It starts from the very first verse assuming that you know that there's a God. But we can't, because we can't grab God, put a picture of him up here on the screen, bring him through the door, we can't 100% prove that there is a God. But there are clues. There are many, many clues. We're only going to look at three this morning. But I would encourage you, I hope that what we do this morning just whets your appetite a little bit and that you'll want to look deeper into some these clues because there's many many clues and the idea is that as you string these clues together the conclusion that you come to is he's there he's there so let's dive into it this morning and like I said there's there's many clues there's been some great books on the subject I would encourage you, go to YouTube, just punch in the existence of God. You're going to see all kinds of stuff up there. There's some great things. Those of you that are going to the hymn conference, this there'll be a man speaking there by the name of uh, Ralph. He's a great uh, uh, author and speaker, and he has a lot on this subject and topic. And I would encourage you, make sure that you go and hear him every opportunity that you have. But here's some clues. When we're, when we're talking about God, we want to look at some, some, some things that point to his existence. And the first one, I'm calling it the big banger clue. Scientists have discovered that our universe is expanding. It's, it's moving out, right? And, and as the scientists and the mathematicians have worked all these calculations together, they said, well, if that's true, if it's expanding, 
then what that shows and demonstrates is that at one time, if it's expanding out, it, you could trace it back to a particular point where it all started. You think of it, uh, think of kind of like a cone, right? Kind of like this shape, and at some time comes right back here, and there's a point of beginning. And science tells us it's at that point where there was this big bang, this explosion. That's what it looks like when they, when they, they do the, 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 the math. and the, It looks like everything just kind of poof, went off there like that. And I've got a little video clip that explains it a little bit better, so let's watch that right now. At the dawn of time, the universe explodes into existence, from absolutely nothing into everything. But everything is actually a single point, infinitely small, unimaginably hot, a super dense speck of pure energy. The Big Bang was so immense that it brought into existence all of the mass and all of the energy contained in all of the 400 billion galaxies we see in our universe in a region smaller than the size of a single atom. The entire observable universe was a millionth of a billionth of a centimeter across at that time. Everything was compressed into an incredibly hot, dense region. It's not even matter yet, just a point of raging energy. It was the beginning of the universe and everything in it. Everything was simple. All the forces that we know about today were one and the same. The universe was amorphous. It had no structure. In that instant of creation, all the laws of physics, the very forces that engineer our universe, began to take shape. The first force to emerge was gravity. The fate of the universe, its size, structure, and everything in it, was decided in that moment. The singular point of immense energy, and they even used the word, I don't know if you caught it, creation, did you hear that? And then, then they said, and from that point, and this, Bang, this explosion. The laws of physics began. Gravity began. Wow. <laughs> wow. Ask, where did that come from? <laughs> uh, that doesn't answer the question for me. That poses a bigger question. <coughs> who was the banger? <laughs> who banged it? I mean, who? Right? I mean, that's, it's, it's amazing to think that, I mean, here's all this energy. Where's, it, where's the energy coming from? Here's the laws of physics, gravity. How to get in there? Where did it come from? I mean, uh, am, I, am I asking legitimate questions? Or, so, <laughs> here's all the particles, gases, everything. Boom, and it just starts expanding. Science says it's, it's kind of like a balloon that just popped. And, it, and again, it's like, okay, wow, that, that's interesting. But where did the balloon come from? Where did all this stuff come from? See, logic and reason tells me as I observe things that everything has a cause. Everything's brought it. Now, if we walked in here this morning and there was a car sitting in the middle of the chapel, we would all assume somebody put a car in the middle of the chapel. Mm -hmm. Nobody probably in their right mind would say, wow, I guess that just happened, <laughs> right? We would all assume that something caused that car to be put there. Logic tells me that, that for everything there's a cause 
So what caused the Big Bang? <laughs> See, I don't have a problem with the Big Bang. <laughs> because Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God, bang, created the heavens and the earth. It would look like a Big Bang. I, I would think it would look like a Big Bang. If all of a sudden there's nothing and you throw the universe into existence, it would look like a Big Bang. Yeah. So you go all the way back, suck it all the way back, to that point of beginning the Big Bang, and you go, wow, where's this energy? Listen to Jeremiah 10, 12. It is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding, he's stretched out the heavens. You see it? <clears throat> Scripture answers the Big Bang. It's amazing because I was reading an article and it was a physicist who was saying that, yeah, yeah, we can, we can, we can trace it all back to this one point, and this is where the laws of physics all began. But in the article, he says, but we still have a problem. Because we don't know where the laws of physics were developed. See, there's got to be a cause. There's got to be a reason. Logic tells us, okay, there was a big bang. It all came into being. But what brought it into being? And many, many scientists will say today, well, it just happened. It just was nothing, and it just became something. Folks, that takes more faith to believe than a god. So, so when we look at the Big Bang, we have to ask ourselves, well, who caused the bang? And the clue there is, wow, whatever, whatever this was, it would have to be outside of time and space. It would have to be immaterial. It would have to be incredibly powerful. It, it would have to be intelligent because, again, we're talking about laying out the laws of physics and gravity and all these other things. And, and it would have to be an uncaused cause. And again, can, can you say dogmatically at the end of all that, well, there you go, it's God, that proves it. No, you can't say dogmatically, but it certainly points blue point of a God. Here's, here's the second clue. Nine clue. And, and, it, and it goes something like this. The universe has design. There must be a designer. I intricacy and complexity of nature points to a designer. Um, order doesn't come from disorder. So, I bring my iPad out and I say, look what I have. And you go, wow, that's kind of nice. I go, yeah, man, this does all kinds of really cool things. I can read books on it. I can watch movies on it. I can take notes on it. I can take pictures with it. I can listen to music with it. And you go, wow, that's really nice, man. Those are amazing gadgets. The person that designed that must have been really smart. And I look at you and I go, what are you talking about, the person that designed it? Nobody designed that. And you say, what are you talking about? I said, well, I found this. <laughs> I found it out back. I was digging some holes a couple years ago and I was digging and bam, I, I hit something and I moved the dirt away and there was my iPad. <laughs> and you say, well, how do you think it got there? I have a theory. At one time there was a whole lot of water and there were these minerals and gases and there was 
a lightning bolt of some form, some electrical charge that brought all of this together and coalesced work and what came about was this. <laughs> And you would say, you have a very deep problem, Randy. And I say, no, no, not at all. Not at all. It, it, what, it didn't, look, I'm not an idiot. It didn't just happen in a couple of days or months. This took millions, perhaps billions of years to develop this. And you laugh because you look at it and you go, come on, that's ridiculous. It, there was someone with intelligence that had to put this together to make it to work the way that it does. That, that doesn't just happen. We don't look at these things and say they, they just happen. There's someone who first worked it out in a design format and then started to put the pieces together to make the components that make the whole thing work. And yet, we look at something as amazing as a human body and say, it all started in a tiny pool of water, too small amoeba, too small to be seen by the human eye. And there was electrical impulses. And it all began. And we sit there and we go, wow. It's amazing that this all just developed over time, millions and billions of years. And we, we don't snicker and laugh. We don't even question. But do you realize when you really stop and break it down how ridiculous that, that is that not more ridiculous than assuming this all just happened? When we look at, at a body, when we look at life, and we look at the intricacies of it, it's an amazing thing. The cell, one cell in your body, is a whole manufacturing plant in and of itself. There are literally motorized workings within each tiny cell of your body. Just now, as we studying for years and years, the whole breakdown of DNA and the epigenomes and all these aspects of the cell, they're just now starting to figure it out. And they're still, they're, they admit, there's years down the road before they'll ever have it totally figured out. And yet that's one little tiny cell. And we go, that just happened. It just, just happened. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 139. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it. Hey, I was watching something and doing some fascinating things with uh, uh, prosthetic limbs. Because we have so many folks coming back from these different wars that we've been in over the years that have had uh, a loss of limb, they've been really zeroing in on how to help these folks out. And they've done some fascinating things. And they were, they were showing some of the, um, the artificial limbs that they can now actually uh, uh, fuse into the nervous system. And you make a, uh, an arm move out and you can make fingers move. And, and, and yet, even with all of that, they admitted that we'll never be able to totally replicate the complexity and the movement of a natural arm and the quickness and the speed and the power and everything that goes with it. With all that we know and with all the technology that we have, they can't do better than that. And yet, somehow we think happened, that we're all just products of chance. And we tell our kids that. You're just a product of chance. You're just, you're just a product of, of, of evolution and, you know, survival of the fittest and all of that stuff. And then we wonder why they struggle with meaning for life. 
If there's no designer, if there was no purpose, if there was no reason, then what's the point? Folks, the reality is, if there is no designer, if there is nobody that started all of this with the Big Bang, if there is no point of beginning with a being that said, I will make all of this, then there really is no purpose. There really is no meaning. And we should be jumping off buildings. I mean, you can understand why at that point. But, but the reality is the clues, that just the logical clues, you see design, you see order, you see, man, something with intelligence has put all of this together. And then number three, call it the morality clue. And it, and it reads something like this, since there are moral laws we live in what we call, it's termed many times, a relativistic society. That means we don't want to impose our truth on anybody. Your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, and we really shouldn't impose on each other. There really isn't, you know, who's to say what's right and wrong? It's really kind of left up to the individual. And all that works really well until somebody steals your car. <laughs> all that sounds great until someone breaks into your house. And then you're mad. Then you're upset because somebody has done me wrong. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. How can we say that that was wrong? I mean, maybe they felt like it was right. You say, well, Randy, that's ridiculous. There's a certain sense of, of at least some basic morality that's kind of universal. That everybody would say that there are certain things that, that shouldn't go on, right? No, somebody said, I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe there's any kind of absolutes, any kind of morality. Well, let me show you a few pictures and let me get your idea. Look at this first picture. This is a picture of a 10-year-old boy being controlled by ISIS just before he assassinated two men this past week. Would you say that's wrong? Here's another picture. This is a picture of women who were enslaved in a sex trafficking ring in India that were free. The sex slave trade is wrong? You know, worldwide, people will say, yeah, that's bad. That shouldn't happen. Ten year old, let alone anybody else, assassinating people. It's wrong. It's just not right. We do it. This is wrong. And we shouldn't allow it to happen. Who says? Who says? Where's, where's the standard? Who says that that's wrong? Say, well, um, everybody's evolved a certain sense of morality because survival of the fittest, you know? I mean, you, you've got to have at least a certain sense of kindness and selflessness in order to just survive. Well, that may work out really good within the group, but what if my group says that your group shouldn't be allowed to live? I'll be kind and selfless within my group, but your group shouldn't live. In fact, your group may be weak. We're the fittest. You're the weakest. And so we decide that we don't want you around. See, in the very least, what you have to come to the conclusion of is that there is no God, that there is no one that started the Big Bang, if there is no designer, if there is no one who has set the laws of nature in motion, 
then how on earth can we say that anything is dogmatically right or wrong? How did we have the right to go into Nazi Germany and say that they were wrong? They believed they were doing the world a favor. They believed they were doing right. They were ridding the world of the weak. And yet, we said that our morality was greater than their morality for some reason. How can you do that if there's no standard? If everyone becomes their own standard, their own voice of right and wrong, how can you possibly step into another society and say that we demand that you stop using 10-year-olds to kill people? We demand that you stop sex trafficking. Demand because people have basic rights. Who says? See, the reality is, folks, that when you trace those types of things back, you have to come back to an ultimate lawgiver, an ultimate good. See, you can't know evil without good. You realize that. You, would, you and I would never know what wrong was. We would never know what evil was unless there was good. And the only way you can measure what good is is if there is an ultimate good. And so, again, logic tells us, reason tells us, there must have been, because we even know good and evil, there must be an ultimate good. Listen to how Scripture words it. Romans chapter 1. Verse 18, it says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Which was known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what was made so that they are without excuse. Let, let me break this down a little bit for you. God says in his word here, he says that there were unrighteous men who suppress the truth of unrighteousness. What is that? What, 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 what are they suppressing? The, the, the truth that's being suppressed is the truth, if you read the context, that there is an inner voice that says there's a God. There's an inner voice as we look around, and we looked at three of these this morning, and as we look around, we go, man, logic points to the fact that if there was a big bang and there was an energy, there had to be a beginning of that energy, there had to be something that started that energy. Logic and reason tells us that if there's design and laws in nature, there must be someone who designed it that way. Logic tells us that if there's good and evil, we would know good and evil unless there was an ultimate good. And so to say that none of that is true and that there is no God is to suppress the truth. And that word suppress literally means to hold down, to hold down that which is innate in us, that which logic says, just look, just, it tells you that there is a God. No, 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 I'm going to push that down. I don't want to hear that. I'm going to... And that's the picture. And Scripture says that when it's all said and done, since the creation of the world, His attributes, in other words, His fingerprints are all over everything. His eternal power and divine nature, they've been clearly seen. It's not hidden. It's not like, oh, we gotta, we got to really search for this stuff. It's there. Being understood through what has been made. And creation screams that there's a God. And the final conclusion, they are without excuse. The word in the original literally means they're without a defense. A legal defense. If he went on trial before the judge of the universe, he would say, you have no excuse. You should have known. My fingerprints were all over everything. You should have been able to see that there was a designer. You should have been able to know just by logic that there was a 
person who began the Big Bang. You should have known good and evil had to have an ultimate good. You are without excuse. So we take just, just these three, just these few, and we look at them and we say, hey, can we dogmatically say, yeah, absolutely, he's proved that they're, no, no. But the clues are strong. If you walked into a quiet forest and nobody else was around, and you came across a beach ball, you would assume somebody's put that beach ball there. Somebody was here before I was, and they put that ball there. Now, if you came into the forest and you found a beach ball, and it was a big beach ball, like, say, the size of a house, you would assume somebody really big has been here before me and put this beach ball. If you see something really big, like the earth, you would assume somebody was here before me and put this all here. Psalms tells us this, not only are we fearfully and wonderfully made, the psalmist tells us that the night sky and the day dictate to us that God is here. At the top of your notes, we put a verse, Hebrews 11:6. It says this, it is impossible to please God without faith. See, folks, let me stop there for a minute. I'm not contending that believing in God doesn't take faith. Ultimately, it does. Ultimately, when you go all, all the way back to the point of the Big Bang, and you go, okay, how did that all get there? And we say, well, it seems to me that it had to be something outside of space and time. It had to be all-powerful, had to be non-material, had to be intelligent. Wow, sounds like God. That takes faith, though, right? Because none of us were there. But so does the other side. So does the atheist who comes to the point where they say, well, it just all, there was, it was particles and, and they were just all there. That takes faith too. We're not talking about two different uh, end conclusions where one takes faith and the other just takes pure, simple knowledge and reason. We're talking about two situations that take faith when it's all said and done. And scripture says it's impossible to please God without faith. Listen. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe first that God exists and that he is a rewarder or rewards those who sincerely seek him. What are they talking about? They're talking about honest doubters, honest seekers, that God will reward with what? With the knowledge. I'm here. Hey, go back and look at those passages in the Gospels that we looked at last week and see how Jesus dealt with those doubters. He didn't scoff them. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't turn them away. He gently revealed himself to them and dealt with them right where they were at. And folks, scripture tells us, listen, a person who sincerely wants to know, God will reveal the truth to him. Is there a God? Well, I would say reason and logic seem to overwhelmingly demonstrate that there is an intelligence out there at the very least. So if there is a God, as we watched the video earlier, what does he want from us? Has he even told us? Has he spoke to us? And if he has, can we know for sure that it's from and if he has, what do we do with what he said? That's what we'll pick up next week. Would you bow your heads, please, and close your eyes?